The following recording is a presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Rohnert Park, California, and of Pastor Val Mark Smith. We are an independent Baptist congregation committed to the accurate presentation of the historical doctrines of the faith. We welcome you to visit our services anytime here in the Rohnert Park area. I'd like you to open your Bibles now, if you would, to uh, the New Testament, to Paul's first letter to the Thessalonian church. We're in a long study of a short letter that was written by Paul to a church that was one of his favorites of all that he founded. And we might not think that this church would have such a deep place in Paul's heart when we understand the adversity from which this church was birthed. Thessalonica was an unwelcome place. Paul was forced out of town. He was run out of town with pursuers hotly behind. And after preaching in this city for only three weeks, he was forced to leave, but he did leave behind him a small band of disciples that were eager, just eager to learn more about the faith and the Lord that they had come to know. And so when they became believers, they weren't treated any better than Paul was when he was in the city. And perhaps knowing how difficult it was for these believers in the persecution that they faced, that uh, Paul loved them because they were filled with love, faith, and hope. And because of this, they became very endeared to the apostle. And so with only a brief time to teach them, their lack of training caused misunderstandings of the faith. Uh, They knew they were saved, but Paul said, you're lacking in areas. There are things that you still need to learn. You need to get into the deeper doctrines of the faith. And so this letter deals especially with the misunderstanding of Christ's second coming. And correspondingly, they had difficulties with their sanctification uh, as they studied and learned more about the doctrines of the faith and waited on Christ to return. Now, Thessalonica was much like I mentioned the Corinthian church. Uh, These are people that grew up in idol worship. And so they had to be changed from that. I mean, they had their lives had to be totally redirected towards Jesus Christ, a completely different type of worship. And so, yes, they had problems in their sanctification. In the third chapter, in verse number 10, Paul wrote that he desired to be with them. He had to leave, but he writes this letter to them, and he said, I'd like to perfect those things that are lacking in your faith. And so he concentrated on these three areas in the letter, the areas of faith, love, and hope, and strengthening those areas he knew would cause the church to endure and to survive into the future. Now, we're closing in on the end of this letter where he fills the church in on critical areas that will help them to endure and survive. Now, if you look in the fifth chapter, his closing remarks begin with a command about church leadership. The last time our subject was leadership and how leaders are to shepherd the flock. And then we talked about the people, how they are to respond to leadership and follow the leaders. And so he writes in verses 12 and 13 of this fifth chapter, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for the work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now, the importance of these two verses is to recognize that it is God who appoints leaders. The Lord gives authority to leadership. And so when the pastor stands in a pulpit on the platform, as I'm doing here today, whenever I speak and I expound the word of God, I stand here in the place of Christ under his authority. Now, the man that stands here is not Christ, and he is not perfect, and you can be sure I am not perfect. I'm to exercise authority over the church without being authoritarian. And because of the work that I do, I should be respected and respected and given consideration for my weaknesses. And so while you consider the frailties of your pastor, you also must consider the responsibility there is to teach you about Christ and to lead you into a closer relationship with him. Secondly, Paul talks about the church esteeming the pastor, and that's a word that means to respect his authority because of the type of work that he does. So you must take care of the pastor, not only giving him words of encouragement, you're also to submit, that's what the Bible says, and then you're also to care for the pastor with financial support so that he can devote his time to studying the word and leading the church. 
This is sacred employment that I do. And so, as he says here, esteem the pastor, the leadership for the work stay sake. So Paul began his last instructions dealing with leadership because the leadership must be right. The church must respond to it properly to prosper. And now having spoken on leadership, he leads us into the instructions on fellowship. How is the church to live together? Well, we're reminded that Paul as he preached in this city, traveled throughout the city and all of its neighborhoods. This was a very diverse city because Thessalonica was a cosmopolitan city. It was at a crossroads and travelers from different parts of the empire mixed and mingled in its neighborhoods. And there were various ethnicities, there were nationalities, there was much diversity in the church and living in fellowship was often a problem. Paul preached to slaves and to slave owners. He preached to elite thinkers like philosophers, but he also preached to the uneducated. He preached to the poor and to the rich. He preached to males and to females. He preached to the wicked and the self-righteous. He preached to all of them because all need the gospel of Christ and the gospel of Christ can save all. But the problem, the problem persists that diverse people can have issues living together. Trying to keep them straight as they follow the Lord could be very frustrating. And the only thing that would knit these people together was the common faith that they had in the Lord Jesus Christ. As Paul wrote in Galatians, he says in the third chapter, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. How do we live and work and fellowship together in the church? Now, the same issues that affected the Thessalonian church affect us. We are also, if you look around, we are also a very diverse group. Thankfully, we live in a different time. And I hope that our ethnicities are not so much the things that divide us. But still, I wonder and I'm amazed at how we are so diverse. And yet, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we desire the same things. We live by the same principles. We share the same faith. And we all want the same things for our families. Now, under any other circumstances, this much diversity that we see here would never blend. We would never find commonality. We would never want to intertwine our lives in the way that we do. One, one night in the Wednesday evening Romans class, I looked down our long table in the conference room with people sitting on each side. Their Bibles were open. They were conversing with one another and fellowshipping. And I looked at the people who were there together, eagerly anticipating God's word and spending time together. And I sat for just a moment wondering why each week we are there. Well, what brings us together? And I commented for just a few minutes on those observation, observations. Then later I found that, that Linda had left a note on my desk and it was an encouraging note. And she commented about how the church had been taught the same doctrines of the faith and that we were unified in Christ. That we have the same Lord and we have the same mind. We have the same affections. And of course that was true. Our unity is in Christ. We are all in Christ and so if we're united in him we will also be united to each other now listen folks it's as plain as these verses that Paul wrote in Ephesians 4 he wrote about the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace and there he says there is one body and one spirit even as you're called in one hope of your calling one Lord one faith one baptism one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all now, the fellowship of the church, the care and concern that we have for each other, despite all the elements of diversity, that happens because we are one in Christ. We are united in him, and as we strive to be more like him, we grow closer to each other. So it's the thing that makes it hard for us to leave each other. We, we experienced this just a few months ago with the departure of the Coons family. And it was unity in the faith that caused Paul to agonizingly long for these people 
in Thessalonica and desired to be with them. He hated to leave converts behind as he had to go on to start other churches. Well, while we're unified, uh, while we are unified and, uh, and while we are so much alike because of Christ, the diversity that we have in the church is also valuable. And that's because each of us brings something different to the table. We are one body, and yet the Lord puts among us a diversity of gifts that enables us to fill all the areas of the church when needed. The church survives uh, personal differences because we put those aside and we strive together for the common goal of the gospel. And so next in his parting words for the church, Paul speaks of their fellowship. And we are not so naive as to believe that we can live without trouble. We are saved, but we're saved sinners. Our flesh is still very, very hard for us to overcome. And sometimes our individualism gets in the way that rises at times and causes problems in the body. Now, in verses 14 and 15, the apostle speaks of our fellowship. Now, we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Now, I believe our first order of business in analyzing and applying this text is to reflect on the purpose for us being here. The number one ministry of the church is the exaltation of Christ. And the number one method of doing this is to preach the word. The number one purpose in all forms of worship is the glory of Christ. And so if there's anything that stands in the way of the glory of Christ, that must be overruled because anything else is wickedness. The apostle John wrote, 1 John 5, 19, and we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Do you think about that just a minute? We are of God and we were once part of the world's wickedness, but we aren't any longer. We're different. Christ made us different. And as Paul wrote in Romans, he said, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Our lives are lived according to Christ's holy character. And so in that Wednesday night class, I could look down that table and I could see diverse people with all having the same thought in their minds. How can we learn here? How can we apply the word of God so that we can be more like Christ? And as I look at that table and those people on each side, I wonder why isn't there more of the church there? Why aren't there more of God's people there doing the very same thing? Because it's the fellowship of believers like we have in that class that produces a tightly interlocked body of believers. Now, instead of doing what the wicked world does and choosing a thousand other things that we could do, we choose to fellowship around the word. And you're here on this Sunday morning for the same. You choose to be here where there are a hundred forms of recreation that can occupy your time on a Sunday. And so because of Christ, you will sit here and you will listen to this message. Because of Christ, you'll not complain when it reaches 12.15 and I'm not quite done. No, you're not quite that sanctified yet, are you? Uh, I expect we will have some complaints. Well, because of Christ, Many of you will take only a few minutes to eat this afternoon. The choir members will rush back here for practice. Because of Christ, many of you will be here at four o'clock to get into the Word again. See, the proof of the power of the saving uh, ability of Christ and what He does for us is, is in your life, there is a demonstration of a change of desires. So that this place becomes our place. And these people in the church are the ones that you desire fellowship with more than any others. This is what salvation does. It changes our focus so that the people of God want to be with the people of God. We're weary with the world, and this is where we find respite from the weariness of living in a sin-cursed environment. A bit of heaven, I would say, is experienced when we come here, when we're moved in song and prayer and preaching the word to think on Christ. Now, we notice in the text that Paul leans, as he leans into this subject of fellowship, he appeals to a certain sense of decorum for the church. How do people act? How do they maintain good relationships? How do we stop disruptions in the body of Christ? 
If we are to live together, we must be in agreement to discipline those who interrupt the fellowship. So number one, this is what I want to talk to you about, is the discipline of the church. He says, now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Now, if you would, for just a moment, look into the second letter of Thessalonians, chapter 3. Here the apostle wrote in verse number 7, he says, For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. And then he goes on in verse number 11 to say, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now, I want you to concentrate on two words here for these next few minutes. The words unruly and disorderly that we find in the second letter. Now, Paul used himself as an example. His life was orderly. He was principled. He conducted his secular business in a way to enhance his spiritual business. And his purpose in addressing the unruly and disorderly is revealed in that 11th verse of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Because they had misunderstandings about the return of Christ, some in the church gave up their jobs. And they didn't do anything but wait for Christ to show up. They were convinced that he was coming soon. That's the teaching. Christ is coming right away. So they just gave up their jobs and they sat down and they waited. And then when Christ didn't come, here they are, they're left without jobs. But they weren't left without something to do. And so instead of doing their own business, they got into the business of others. And when they ran out of resources, they expected that church people would take care of them while they went about talking and gossiping and going from house to house and just stirring up trouble. Now, let me say first that, that church people need to take care of church people. When one of us is down and out and we have a problem, then if we can help, we ought to. But at the same time, there are too many that look at the church as the welfare agency. You know, I regularly get people who have nothing to do with the church. They call me. They want money. They want to pay electric bills. They want to pay phone bills. They want to pay their cell phone bills. I even had a call one time where a lady said, hey, you know, I really need some cat food. Could you buy me some cat food? And you know what I said to her uh, about that. So people will ask for money, but they don't have anything to do with the church, and they won't come to the church. They won't even show up here except to pick up their check. Well, we do want to help people. And, and as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are concerned about people in our community. But we must understand how that concern is to be used and directed. It was never Jesus' goal, and it was never the apostles' goal, and it was never the church's goal to help people apart from the main goal of giving people the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, inside the church, though, it's different. We're a body that works and lives together, and yet there needs to be some decorum about our business. Now, the problem in the Thessalonian church became so acute that in the second letter, Paul said, I told you when I was there, if a person will not work, neither shall he eat. That's in verse number 10, in case you missed it in 2 Thessalonians 3. If you don't work, you don't eat, Paul said. Well, that sure spoils the welfare system, doesn't it? Well, since when was work required to eat? That's a novel concept, isn't it? People that don't work, though, will often end up just as Paul describes here. They're busybodies. They don't have anything to do. They have no work, and so they just stir up trouble. And so for us to live together, there must be discipline. No matter the organization, there are certain rules to be obeyed. Order must be maintained to accomplish the purpose of an organization's existence. And so to operate without proper procedures is chaos. That's confusion. And it brings about the destruction of that organization. And it's no different in the Church of Christ. The rules that we follow are not man-made. They're perfect rules because they are divinely inspired. God gave these rules, and he is the perfect lawgiver. Now, often we're criticized about Christian living uh, because we're too restrictive. People say you're just too prudish, you're too puritanical, and that's okay. That's fine. We'll own that criticism because the way that we live was commanded by Jesus Christ. The way that we live keeps us treating each other as we should be treated. 
The way that we live is for our best welfare and for the welfare of others. While the way that others live in the wickedness of the world, I mean, since when was that good for anybody? Why would we want to change a perfect plan that was given by the perfect Christ? So he talks about being disorderly. You, you, we can't put up with those that are disorderly. Then we have this word unruly. That, that's not a word normally used in a religious context. I mean, we're talking about Greek here, so that's not, not something, uh, this word is not something normally used in religious context because it's a military term. It refers to a soldier that breaks rank. Another word that's used is insubordination. It means nearly the same thing. And it means the refusal to follow orders. So you see, Paul warns the church about stepping out of line. And he says, Christians can't break ranks. There is no room for individualism in the church. Do, do you understand that? Does that surprise you? To say there's no room for individualism when that is exactly what the world says you need to be? You need to be your own person. You need to do your own thing. Whatever you think is best, that's okay because that's best for you. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible insists on a body of members that work together as a team. It insists on a membership that's concerned about each other. And we put all of these personal preferences aside for the good of the body. So Paul uses this military term, and it's just like this, thinking like this. When does a general encourage his troops to go do their own thing? How do they win a battle unless the army stays together? And so Paul appealed to military terms. You know, he had to have the cohesiveness of the Roman army in his mind. That's a unified fighting machine. They stuck together in the fight when they could see the wounded were falling around them. I mean, they were so much together that the Roman soldier just stepped over the dead and kept on fighting. And that's the kind of resolve that we need for the church to stay alive. So the world hurls its insults at us. It disagrees with everything we do. But no matter how much oppression and how much criticism we get from others, we can't break ranks. Our cause will fail if we don't discipline the ones that stray away and cause harm to the body. And so to destroy the church by being unruly, that is a sign of our surrender. And this is a theme that's repeated throughout Scripture. We must obey. You see this. We must submit. We must be disciplined to work together for the good of the body. Our individualism is not the most important. The body of Jesus Christ is the most important. And so we keep the body together, moving together, because the church is of supreme importance. Well, then what do we do with the unruly? Well, we, we don't shoot them, though sometimes we would like to. There, there's a simple, uncomplicated method in Scripture for dealing with them. There isn't a 12-step program to recovery. Paul's simple plan to recover the wayward just happens to be Jesus' simple plan. Now, before we get to that, Paul said, warn them. And he doesn't, he doesn't mean this in the sense that you tell them if they don't straighten up, you're going to cut off their head. Oh, this is Christianity, not Islam, so we don't cut off heads. And if I could be a bit colloquial with you, it doesn't mean cut off your head, but it does mean knock some sense into them. Warn means to admonish. It means to strongly encourage them, urge them, not by putting them down, not by judging, not by ostracizing and immediately pushing that person out. But it means to warn them of danger, to warn that souls are in danger for harming fellowship. But we see this word discipline, and that's like a nasty word today, isn't it? Discipline has so many negative connotations. I mean, people think discipline, and the first thing that comes to their mind is beating up on children. I mean, that's what we do. If you're a disciplinarian as a, as a parent, well, that just means that you just beat up on your kids all the time. Well, the Bible... And the word discipline doesn't mean that at all. In fact, it's not negative. It's a very positive thing. It means simply the word comes from, from uh, 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 the idea of just helping people to learn. It means to teach as a means of keeping order. Now, the unruly are those that step out of line with the teaching. So they need to be disciplined to get back into the ranks. Now, back to this simple plan of discipline. Are you aware 
that Jesus and the apostles were not like the church growth gurus that you hear from today. Nearly every week I, I, I get an email from one of these church growth people about strategies for growing the church. You might remember, oh, some months ago I told you about a, an email I received and a flyer that I received. And it was a testimonial from pastors who had hired a Christian comedian. And they said, well, the Christian comedian came and the pews in the church were filled. And so their message and their advice was, you need to have this, this Christian comedian come to your church too, and then your pews will be filled, and then your church will grow. Well, I looked for that in Acts, and I couldn't find it. And I looked for it in the Gospels, and as far as I could tell, Jesus didn't tell jokes. And so I look for that in the Bible, and I can't seem to find so many other strategies that they have. I can't find a light show. I can't find a performance band. Now, skip looking in the Bible. Just go on the Internet and sometimes just type in these words, Christian bands. You know what pops up? Demon Hunter, Skillet, Super Chick, Seventh Day Slumber. That's just to name a few. The scriptures do not have an entertainment venue for growing the church. The Bible doesn't talk about methods except in one place. And that's in Ephesians 6 verse 11. Paul wrote that we must put on the whole armor of God. And that's not lost on me that he used a military term. He says put on the whole armor of God. And why did he say it? That you might be able to stand against the wilds of the devil. Now, are you ready for this? The wiles, he says. The Greek word there is methodia, the methods of whom? The devil. Jason, I mean, the devil. I mean, if, if, you, want, if you want methods, the devil has plenty of methods. And his methods will destroy the church. Oh, the church might grow. That's what they promised. The church will grow, and it does. But who does it grow with? It grows with the devil's crowd, not the disciplined saints of God. So how did Jesus and the apostles teach that the church would grow? Well, the strategy for church growth was to remove everything that hinders growth. The gospel will grow the church if all the hindrances to the gospel are removed. And that means people and it means methods. Do you know what often stands in the way of the church? People. When people break ranks, they cause trouble, and then church growth is hindered. A few, uh, few years ago, I was looking for churches that we could fellowship with, and I went to a conference that was a denominational fellowship, and interestingly, the theme of this conference was conflict resolution. And that was okay, except there was a conflict in the conference that was about conflict resolution. Many were in conflict about the speaker, who is speaking on conflict resolution. So I'm attending a Baptist conference and I come to find out that the man who was teaching was a Presbyterian. And so immediately there was conflict. I mean, there were people there saying, well, we don't want to hear from a Presbyterian. What's a Presbyterian doing instructing Baptist pastors? And so there was a conflict in the conference about conflict resolution. Anybody see the irony in that? And, and my reaction was, well, why would I want to bring our church into this fellowship when as a visitor, all I can see is conflict? Conflict stands in the way of progress and conflict always harms the church. So let me go over the simple rules in scripture for disciplining the unruly and dealing with conflict. Paul said, warn them. And that's not a harsh word. It's about admonishing and encouraging for the good of the person, for the good of the church, for the good of all of us. It's a way to bring about conflict resolution. So let me give you these rules to live by that will help you and the church. I don't often like church rules, but I do like these. The first one is the rule of love. Love was high on Jesus' list, wasn't it? In fact, he, he reduced the Ten Commandments to just two, and they were about love. He said, love God and love your fellow man. Now that second one, love your fellow man, that's the part about maintaining good relationships in the church. And the second commandment is actually a demonstration of the first. It shows that you really do love God because that causes you to love your fellows in the church. 
Jesus said in John 13, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. I'm not going to turn to it now, but this was expounded by John in 1 John, where he just hammered down on this issue and told us that, that, that loving a Christian brother is a characteristic of Christianity. Christians must love each other or they're not true disciples of Christ. Then James up the ante by calling this the royal law. Do you remember that? In the book of James, he said this is the royal law. Why did he call it the royal law? because it was given by King Jesus. It's a rule for the kingdom and the apostle says, this is also a rule for the church. Jesus said, not just our friends you're supposed to love, but also love your enemies. And if we can love our enemies, it's so much easier to love those in the church who are just like us. There is no born again believer in your church that is an enemy. Oh, they might not always act as they should, but they're not enemies. So what happens when you love them and you approach them in love rather than strife? Well, I can tell you that it's disarming. Approach someone that, that has harmed you, done something against you, and you approach them in love, that becomes disarming. So a true believer who has the Spirit of God living in him can't react to love by refusing to be reconciled. If he truly believes and you show him love, he'll not persist in breaking rank. Now keep that thought in mind because I want to show you what the Bible says about that person who is in fact persistent about it and refuses to be reconciled. Anger, jealousy, strife, these are conflicts that are resolved in Christian love. So what are you to do? Ephesians 4.31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So the first rule is love. You can't do better than to walk in love. Now, the second rule is the rule of confession. Are you out of line or is there someone else that's out of line and has broken rank? Do you hurt the harmony of the church? Go to the one that you offended and confess or go to the one that offended you to secure their confession. I mean, what, we must heal the differences between us. Now, I find this interesting that the first command given by Christ for the church, I mean, the first time that he mentioned the church, uh, uh, teaching the church, it was in the area of discipline. His first command was about how to reconcile an offending brother. Now, you, you look in the scriptures, you'll find that the very first mention of the church is in Matthew 16, 18. That's where Christ promised that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Then the second mention comes two chapters later in Matthew 18, verse 7, where Jesus said, if your brother offends you, go and tell the ladies' prayer group. No, no, but that's the temptation, isn't it? When someone offends you, go tell somebody. Go complain to somebody about how much you were hurt and how it isn't fair and, and how you're so innocent and get everybody on your side. No, don't go tell anybody. He says, you go to that person one-on-one -on -one and tell them that you are offended and you go in love with the intention of making it right. Matthew 18, 15, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Go to him alone. You don't tell anybody. And if you're the one who offended, then be the first to say you're sorry. Offer an apology. Many conflicts among lo loving brothers are resolved without anybody knowing, without anybody being involved. Well, then you ask, well, what happens if that didn't work? Well, Jesus outlined that as well. He said the next step is to take somebody with you. Go again. Take a witness with you and show them that you're trying to make things right. Get somebody to testify to your good intentions and then perhaps that friend will help you to resolve the conflict. Now the third step is when the church gets involved. If steps one and two didn't work, then the more drastic measure is to take it to the church and the church will judge the matter. That's the last step in conflict resolution and from there either the conflict the conflict will end, I should say, one way or the other. Either it ends in a resolution where all are satisfied and forgiveness is given, or it ends with the offender being removed from the body. 
Now, I said, hold this thought. If a person is a true believer, you shouldn't need the last step. Why? Well, because the Holy Spirit's in us, isn't he? The Holy Spirit lives in us. Christ is in Christians. And so if a person fails to straighten up and to get back into the rank, if they just won't fly right, then they have this problem. Hear what Jesus says. This is their problem. In verse 17 of Matthew 18. And if he shall neglect to hear them, that is, the people of the church, or the person that you took with you, rather, he says, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man or a publican. Not a republican, but a publican. Jesus added this at the end. If the person will not get back into line, then you assume that they are a heathen. That is the same as saying they are unbelievers. So he says, treat them as unbelievers. Now that, that's very serious, and I'm afraid that unbelievers in the church will eventually show who they are. When you look around a moment in our building, who's missing? Who, who was here but isn't here now? And I'm afraid that many of them may be maybe unbelievers. So the rule is confession. James wrote that we must confess our faults to one another. We all have faults, and so we can expect that our faults will sometimes get the best of us. We're all sinners. So we realize when we have a fault, we confess that, and we resolve the conflict. Now, thirdly, is the rule of forgiveness. Remember that after giving these instructions in Matthew 18, that Peter was confused. Jewish interpretations of the law taught him differently. If he was to forgive, then how many times must he forgive? How, how, how many times are we obligated to resolve conflicts between us? Peter said, is that seven times? That's what the Jews taught him. The Jewish law limited the necessity of forgiveness to seven times. I mean, after you've been through this thing seven times and your patience is worn out. But not so, says Jesus. He said, forgive them seven times seventy. And the idea there is not to count, but to give unlimited forgiveness. Forgive as many times that, that it takes. Now, what's that built upon? Well, Ephesians 4.32 says, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. How many of you take a tally of your sins against God? I would imagine that you don't care to count. And if you, if you did, you've lost track a long time ago. How many times has God forgiven you? I imagine you don't count. And if you do, you lost track a long time ago. And so if you're to be like Christ, how many times are you to forgive? Well, you don't count. And you shouldn't count because there's no need to keep track. If you do, then you haven't truly forgiven. And then what again is that basis of forgiveness? It's based on the infinite sacrifice of Christ. He still forgives. He still forgives. He still forgives. He keeps on forgiving. He never stops. The scripture says in Hebrews, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So you are kept sin, uh, saved because there is no sin, there is no conflict against Christ for which there is no forgiveness. Think about how many times you've sinned. You do it every single day and yet Christ forgives. Christ is eternally alive to keep you eternally alive. And so you have no sins that are charged against you because there is limitless forgiveness. Now you see, Paul opened this up to the church at Thessalonica because they're a diverse group. Conflicts were inevitable. And they can either resolve them or they can devour each other. Galatians 5, he wrote, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Now, Paul knew that this would be a problem in Thessalonica as well as in the Galatian churches because all churches have this problem. And as the church matures, it should be less and less a problem. And so for the good of you and for the good of the fellowship, for the good of you as an individual, keep the rules of discipline. Stay in the ranks. Let's, let's behave ourselves decently and in order. That's the command of Christ. 
So once again, as last week, we have a very practical lesson from Paul. It's not flashy. There, there aren't any, there's no smoke and mirrors here. There's no magic tricks involved. There's not even a rollicking comedian here. There are no fog machines. This is right to the point. It's biblical and practical. Now, my last appeal to you then is to consider the value of church membership. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. To be like him, you must also love the church. We say, what is the church? The people. You must love the people. The one who loves the people loves the church. How you treat each other is the way that you treat Christ. Do you remember Jesus said that? The way that you treat other people is the same in your church. It's the same as the way that you treat me. So if you're to be like Christ, then you must love his people as he loves them. I thank God if his favor is upon you, that you're a member of Brian Baptist Church, or if you're a part of the Lord's church in this world. It's a great blessing to have the fellowship of the church and to be in this common bond, the unity of Christ, fellowshipping one another as God's people. That's what we desire. Good harmony in our church. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to this presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Roner Park, California. If you would like further information about our church, please feel free to call us at area code 707-584-7275 or write to us at Brian Baptist Church, 6298 Country Club Drive, Roner Park, California, 94928. Additionally, you may visit us online at www.bebaptist.org.